set every darkness ablaze. But Jesus, amen. No other name carries the power to save, crushes the power of the grave. But Jesus, no other hope can silence the fear in our souls. Our Savior is King over all. Jesus, no other name, no other name, no other name. Amen. I'm nervous. <laughs> go ahead and do it. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and welcome all of you. Welcome to Imagine Church this morning. We are so honored to have all of you here this morning. You know, whoever you are and wherever you are in your faith walk, we welcome here, welcome you here to Imagine Church, and we certainly have a place for you here. Um, I want to thank all of you for your faithfulness in being here this morning. I know it's a hard time of the year. There's vacations, there's family things going on, and I just want to tell you how proud I am of you that you took the time to be here in church this morning and, and how you make that effort, extra effort to be here because you understand that it's important to be here with your family and also to grow spiritually, and that's how we do that. We also want to welcome all of our guests that are here this morning. And we want you to know that if we can ever be of service to you, we would be honored to serve you in whatever way that we can. You know, here at Imagine Church, we have a really good saying, and I love this. And that is, when you come the first time, you're a visitor, you're our guest. But when you're here the next time, you're part of our family. So we just welcome all of you here this morning. Hope all of you enjoy the service this morning, and that God blesses you immensely. Now, Deborah, you can stay up here and sing with us. A woman of, of many talents, and what a blessing that you have these talents from God that you use. So thank you so much for stepping in and being here and sharing all your talents. As we sing this next song, Living Hope. Well, it's not Living Hope. <laughs> we have the, uh, I am not alone. Can we have those words up on the screen? Whatever it is you're going through, no matter what it is, God is with you. And sometimes we feel alone. We feel like we're not worthy and that we are always worthy to do what God's work is. So I just want you to get a prayer right now. And whatever it is you're dealing with or whatever it is you're praising and, and celebrating, let God walk with you. Let him walk beside you. And when you need him to, let him walk in front of you, no matter what it is. When I walk through the deep waters I know that you will be with me when I'm standing in the fire I will not be overcome through the valley of the shadow For me, you will never leave me. I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go before me. You will never leave me. In the midst of deep sorrow, I see your light is breaking through. The dark of night will not overtake me. I am pressing into you. Lord, you fight my every battle. And I will not fear. I am not. You will go 
before me. You will never leave me. I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go before me. You will never leave me. You amaze me, redeem me, you call me as your own. You amaze Call me as your own. I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go before me. You will. Let's sing that a couple more times and really know this. I am not. You are not alone. God is always with you. I am not alone. You will go before me. You will. Let's just sing voices and really believe this. I am not alone, I am not alone, you will go before me, you will never leave me. You may be seated. Jennifer and the Price team, that was just beautiful. Well, this morning, in case you haven't figured it out yet, our pastor Bruce is on vacation. Uh, right now he is at the beach, and I can tell you he wasn't very happy about leaving. I don't think he felt very comfortable about maybe leaving for a Sunday and leaving it in the hands of somebody not quite as seasoned as he is. So we're going to say a lot of prayers this morning that everything goes good, and I've already messed it up, so that when he looks at the YouTube version of this, which we all know he will... <laughs> that he'll be pleased with what we did here this morning. And so what we just need to do is just to let go and let God have control of everything, and everything will be good. Um, Bruce will be back next Sunday, and he'll be starting a new series next Sunday entitled Follow, Accepting the Invitation of Jesus. So it's going to be a, a good series, and want all of you to be back to be a part of that when he comes back next week. Also next Sunday, we'll have a very special happening, and that will be the celebration of the sacrament of baptism. That's always a wonderful thing, so we're looking forward to that also. This morning, we're very pleased to have Gregory Roberts bringing the message for us. Gregory is also a graduate of Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, and he was our first intern uh, to be here. Uh, he was here between 2015 and 2017, is that correct? Uh, so we're very honored that we have Gregory here this morning that's going to bring God's word to us, um, and we can't wait to hear what you've got in store for us. We have several folks that we have been praying for, and we want to continue praying for those folks. Uh, Lisa Neufer, Randy and Martha Edwards, Joe Oreck, uh, Judy, uh, Julie, who is the daughter of one of Heidi's close friends, we'll continue to pray for her, Laurie Daniels, Vaughn Dunn, Jerry Brownlee, Dick Penman, and we want to pray for, for Gregory and Tamara and all of their family um, who had the death of a cousin in Charleston this week. I think they were down in Atlanta yesterday, and our prayers go out to you and to all of your family as you walk through this very tragic time. Um, also, we pray for Tracy. She's not here this morning, but uh, Tracy and her husband, Stu. Stu has begun his chemotherapy treatments for the uh, for the. Um, tumor that they have found in his lungs. So uh, we want to remain in prayer for them. Keep them in your hearts. Also for Emma Transu as she goes on her mission trip to Thailand and also for uh, Ray Transu's family and his stepfather Wayne Wilson. Uh, we want to remember Phil uh, who plays in the, in the praise team also, uh, his sister and the battle that she is also fighting with her cancer. We lift her up and lift her family up also. Um, and Linda and uh, Jeff are not here this morning. They have a neighbor that lives upstairs. Uh, his name is Paul. And he is uh, suffering. He's like 92, I believe is what you said, um, and suffering from cancer that has metastasized. And so we want to keep all of them in our prayers. Jeff and Linda are there with them this morning. We want to recognize that we have Dawn and her husband back here this morning. Way, welcome. So glad that you guys are here this morning with us. 
Let's also remember the folks in Ohio and Texas and all that's going out there. It just makes my heart bleed. It just makes my heart hurt to, to see all of this that's going on, this useless killing and, and all the families that are affected, not just physically but mentally as they go through all of this emotionally. So let's just keep all of them in our prayers also. Um, and I would like to ask at this time if Carrie Tucker and Carrie DiDonato will come forward. Um, I think that they have an announcement that they want to talk to us briefly about, about an upcoming mission project that you have going on. So if you girls would come forward. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. As was announced last Sunday, and as you uh, perhaps saw in uh, this week's online um, newsletter, we are now in the midst of our school supply collection. Um, it's part of our mission outreach uh, to support the children in, um, I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation, but I believe it's pronounced uh, Bacani, in Bacani, Philippines. Uh, we're going to partner with the church over there, the Jesus Christ Lord of the Tribes and Nations Church, and they will help us distribute the supplies that we connect to those children. So as was printed in the newsletter, there are several ways that you can help with this initiative. One is to, well, this represents it. It's to go online uh, onto Amazon, and you can purchase any of the supplies um, that were listed in the newsletter uh, by clicking on the Amazon link that was provided in the newsletter. Um, you can purchase any or all of the supplies, and there's even an option to drop ship that to my house, and then I would bring that here to church and uh, make sure that those get to the collection um, in case in the event that you aren't going to make it to church one particular Sunday. Another option would be to just go out and shop, shop at Target, shop at Walmart, shop at the dollar store, shop wherever you uh, bargain shoppers might like to shop, find the best deals out there. Again, all the supplies are listed in the newsletter, but we're looking for supplies such as cinch sacks. Um, we are looking for um, glue, crayons, pens and pencils, a little mini pencil sharpener, uh, eraser caps, scissors, a spiral notebook, notebook, and lastly, we would like to include flip-flops, a pair of flip-flops with every kit that we send overseas. Um, and as you can imagine, we're servicing kids of all ages, so we would need a variety of sizes of flip-flops. There's not just one size to buy. And then, of course, the third option would be to donate monetarily. And if you would like to uh, do that, you could drop um, a monetary contribution into the tithing collection market for the missions, uh, Philippine Hope. And we'll make sure that those funds get used not only to purchase items, but they will help us offset our shipping cost uh, so that we can send the shipment overseas. I think that's about it. If you have any questions, uh, my phone number and email were referenced in the newsletter. Don't hesitate to reach out and ask a question. Good morning. Good morning. Back in June, I discussed with Bruce the possibility of having an electronic waste recycling day for the church. The company I work with is USB Recycling and Green Tech Solutions. They're located in Blacksburg, South Carolina, Wadesboro, North Carolina, and they have a location in Malaysia also. Our goal is for the recycling day is to help you get rid of your electronic waste in a safe way. We are approved recycler for North Carolina, South Carolina, and we are R2 and Rios certified. Any equipment you bring will, be, will have a secure data destruction. Hopefully this will give you the opportunity to get rid of your electronic waste with no extra aggravation. We have a long list of items that you can bring, which I will provide to you next week. If you own a business or, and it is safe, it will be a safe way to get rid of the equipment you have retired to buy new equipment. It will be recycled properly and with data totally destroyed. The company will recycle, repurpose, reuse, or reduce every piece of electronic waste. I've spoken to the manager of Office Max at Rivergate, and he is giving us a discount coupon to provide anyone who provides electronic waste to recycle. It can be used to purchase any electronic equipment at that store. After the equipment has been processed by the company, Imagine Church will receive 5% of the net profit uh, 
for making this happen. I, I'm sure Bruce can find a good use for the funds. Next week, I will have a flyer, and then that flyer will have a list of everything you can bring. Thank you. If you have any questions, please just meet me afterwards, and uh, I can answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. I want to thank both of you for your ministries, what you do for Imagine Church, and then what you do on out into our communities. Thank you so much. At this time, we would like to invite the Imagine Kids to meet with your leaders out in the rotunda to go to this morning's Imagine Kids session. We'll ask that the um, nation, Imagine Nation uh, youth remain in here with us as we take communion, and then once that's finished, y'all can go to your sessions this morning also. Dear God, thank you for your goodness. Lord, I know you want me to be blessed and happy. And that's why, God, I pray you, please, let me have this Corvette I've been looking at. I really like it. And God, if it be your will, please make it cherry red. Amen. Lord, I'm single. And I'd really like to find that special someone. I kind of thought you'd have this problem figured out by now. Anyway, now is the time, Lord. Make it happen. Bring me a man. Lord, I know it is your desire to make your children happy. And I've got a situation here. Um, all of my neighbors have gotten in-ground pools. I'm the only one on the block that doesn't have one. God, you can do better than this. As you know, Lord, I just released my first album, and it's not getting the kind of attention I hoped for. God, I know that you are capable of anything. You're all-powerful. So please, Lord, Make my album trend. Make it trend, Lord, make it trend. Ignite social media with your holy fire so that I may be glorified in all I do. Amen. What's going on? Why isn't this working? Come on! I want this car! God, give it to me! Right now! Hello? <laughs> Hello? I don't understand! Where's my pool? Why is this not working? What is wrong with this thing? God, what are you doing? I want this! What is going on? I can't look it out in front of my friends! Are you kidding me? Come on, God. What am I supposed to do? Are you listening to me? Just be a break here! Uh, this is stupid! It's going on! What is the matter? God! I want my car! Uh, God! Are you even listening to me? God, are you even listening to me? At this time, if I could invite Heidi and Tim and Gregory, if you come forth to help with the service of the communion uh, this morning. So I have a little story I'd like to share with you this morning. There was once a very poor little orphan boy who wanted nothing more in the whole world than to have a family. Finally, the opportunity came. 
He was eight years old, and finally a family wanted to adopt him. Well, all the introductions were made, and all the papers were signed, and just six days after his eighth birthday, he was going home with the family. He was so excited. Well, he took everything he had, all of his hopes, and all of his possessions, which were nothing more than the worn, torn clothes that he had on his body, and the clothes and the shoes that he had on his feet that had big holes in them. But he took those, along with his single, soft toy, to his new home. His new parents were so very excited to have him also. So when they got him home, they threw a big celebration dinner for him. They told him he got his own room. And they introduced him to a bunch of the neighborhood kids. He was ecstatically happy. They took all of those old, worn, torn clothes that he had, and they threw them out. And they bought him all new clothes, bunches of them. They bought him a bicycle. They bought him a bunch of toys. And before he knew it, he was like one of the neighborhood kids. And that felt so good to him because he felt loved. He finally felt like he was part of a family. But there was one thing that was very curious about all of it. Because his dad took those old, worn-out shoes with the holes in them, and he put them up on the mantelpiece. The little boy couldn't understand why. Why did his dad not throw those out, too? But he soon came to understand why. Because any time that that poor little boy did anything wrong, his dad would go, and he'd get up those shoes off the mantelpiece, And he'd hold them in front of him. And he would look at him and he would say, look at all we've done for you. Look at all we've bought for you. We gave you everything. And now look at what you're doing. Look at how you're behaving. Well, unfortunately, we all tend to do things like that from time to time, don't we? We do it in our relationships. We do it to family members. We do it to friends. We just can't seem to forget the past and put it behind us and move forward. We just have a problem with throwing out the old shoes. We want to keep them. We don't want to be able to dredge up the past and make that a reason for an action in the present time, right? We all do it. Well, what if God was that way? What if God throwed the old clothes out, but he kept our old shoes? And I'm very thankful that he throws out the old shoes. He forgives us, and he forgets what we've done. He doesn't hold it against us. And as God's people, we too should forgive others. We too should throw out the old shoes. Because even as God has forgiven us, we too are to forgive others. He taught us that. So today I'm going to challenge all of you as we come to the Lord's table. Think about it for a few minutes and throw out the old shoes. Throw out the old shoes that you've got. And let's come to God with a clean heart this morning for all that he has done for us. This morning we have the privilege of being able to receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. It's not an invitation to the table given by a minister. It's not by the congregation. This invitation is given by Jesus Christ himself. And he invites all of us to come, regardless of age, regardless of religion, regardless of where you are in your life or your church affiliation or your background, because he loves us all. And he wants us all to be here, even if you've been away from church for a while or You don't have a relationship with him. You're not a person of faith. You know what? Jesus still invites you to come. If you know the Lord, if you are a believer, you know that how much God loves you, and you know this table is prepared for you, and you know you're invited. But for those that don't know the Lord, those that aren't believers, just know he wants you to come too because this is a means of grace. As you come here, he is showing you, His forgiveness, his mighty love, his mercy, and that wonderful gift of grace. 
This is the way that you come to know all of those things about our Lord. So in the name of Jesus Christ, you are all invited to the table this morning. We know that on the night that his disciples betrayed and deserted him, the Lord Jesus Christ took the bread, and he gave thanks to God. And he said, take, eat, this is my body, broken for you and for many for their sins. Eat it as often as you will in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after the dinner was over, he took the cup, and he gave thanks to God, and he passed it to his disciples. And he said, drink this, drink it often, for this is my blood of the new covenant. Pour it out for you and for many for your sins and for the forgiveness of those sins. Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Gracious, loving Lord, we know that we should forgive others, but the words, I forgive you, are just so very hard to say. And it's even harder to actually just do it. But, oh God, we know that that's how we should live our lives, forgiving others, because your son Jesus Christ taught us to forgive, and he lived his life as an example for us. You know, sometimes, Father God, we come before you at this table, and we admit we just feel so very unworthy to even be in your presence, much less to be partaking in your supper. But, Lord, we realize that it's not a matter of us being worthy, but it's that we can come into your presence at your table because of your great love, because of your mercy, your forgiveness, because of that great gift of grace, because you accept us just as we are. You meet us just where we are. You take all of our brokenness and all of our sinfulness, all of our messed up lives, and you change us in a thousand different ways as we grow in you, yet you don't wait on those changes to invite us. Instead, you say, come now, come to my table, because I love you. And so we humbly come, and we thank you, O oh God, for this holy privilege. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, and there is one loaf that we partake in. Is not the breaking of the bread a means of sharing the blood, the, the body of Jesus Christ? Is not the cup over which we give thanks of means of sharing in the blood of Jesus Christ?
Break the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living in your name Jesus Christ my living hope Hallelujah praise the one who set me free Hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As the host team comes forward, let us prepare our hearts for our morning offering. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians that every man, whether give should give what he or she has decided in their own heart. It should not be given reluctantly, but joyfully, cheerfully. We are also told that you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and that your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Our heart attitude when we give is much more important to God than what we give. So as we give back to God this morning what is already his, let us do so with a thankful heart, overflowing with love for God for all that he has already done for us. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for all that you have provided for us. You have blessed us with money, gifts, 
talents, education, natural abilities, and oh, so much more. You have filled our cups full to overflowing in so many ways, and you have blessed us all way beyond measure. So now, as we humbly come before your throne with these, our offerings, we ask that you accept them and then multiply them for use in your kingdom. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm so confused. I know I heard you loud and clear, so I followed through. Somehow I ended up here. I don't want to think I may never understand that my broken heart is a part of your plan. When I try to pray, all I get is hurt. And these four words, thy will be done, thy will be done, thy will be done. I know you're good. This don't feel good right now And I know you think Of things I could never think about It's hard to count it all joy Distracted by the noise Just trying to make sense Of all your promises Sometimes I gotta stop And remember that you're God and I am not so Thy will be done Thy will be done Thy will be done Like a child on my knees All that comes to me is Thy will be done Thy will are for me goodness you have in store I know you see me I know you hear me Lord This morning I'm going to be reading uh, in the Old Testament the book of Daniel, chapter 3. And a little background is uh, the kingdom was split to the northern kingdom, southern kingdom of Judah. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king, um, deported or exiled some of the Jews to his kingdom in Babylon. And he built this big golden statue and he wanted everybody to worship that golden statue. And um, we'll start there. So uh, the verses today in Daniel chapter 3 are verses 8 through 30. Please listen to the word of God. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward 
and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Bab excuse me, Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered that the furnace, the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. The Nebuchadnezzar came to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. The word of God. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for who you are and that you showed us who you are by sending your son on a rescue mission. 
that's who you are. You're here to save us. You're here to show us the way and to love us, to redeem us, and to deliver us so we can have a relationship with you and spend eternity with you. We thank you for that. I ask that your message be given here. God, my words, God, my thoughts, and God, my heart. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. In the 1946 movie classic, It's a Wonderful Life, George Bailey is on the bridge on the outskirts of Bedford Falls. As Bert the cop comes up to him, you know, George Bailey gets ready to strike him, and then all of a sudden, George realizes, Bert, you know me? Yeah, Bert knows his name. He knows who he is. And then Bert tells him that his mouth is bleeding. To George's delight, my mouth is bleeding. And then he checks his watch pocket to see if his daughter, Zuzu's pedals, are right there. And they are. From this point, George just screams in jubilee, tears off towards town, and then comes to his wrecked car, his wreck, and shouts in jubilee, yay! And then he goes to the town sign, Bedford Falls, screaming, yay! Goes off through main t- the main square of town, shouting Merry Christmas to passerbys, Merry Christmas to the, to the movie house, to the emporium, to... Uh, anybody he saw, the, oh, he didn't forget the Bailey building and loan. He wished that a Merry Christmas, too. And then he goes up to his nemesis, knocking on a window. Who of you would do that today? Go up to the, your, your, your enemy and go up to them and knock on their window and say, Merry Christmas, Mr. Potter. <laughs> then he goes home. He finally makes it to his home. He blows in the house, barely noticing the four men that are standing there. And he tells them, have you seen my wife? Have you seen my wife? And he declares, all this beautiful, wonderful, drafty house. He says it with joy, with glee. He's happy. And he goes to the four men, and one of them is the bank examiner. And he says, George, there's a deficit. He goes, I know it's $8,000. I know all about it. Today, that's $105,000, okay? So think in that, that way. And then there's another guy there. He goes, George, I have something for you. He goes, I bet it's a warrant for my arrest. I'm going to jail. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> and then there's a reporter that clicks, and he's like, oh, this is great. Have you seen my wife? And then he hears his kids from upstairs, and he starts running upstairs, and he grabs that wooden uh, banister knob that he picks up, and then he runs halfway up, and he looks at it, and this used to irritate him to no end, but now he kisses it. Take a look. Watch this. Clarence! Clarence! Help me, Clarence! Get me back! Get me back! I don't care what happens to me! Get me back to my wife and kids! Help me, Clarence, please! Please! I want to live again! I want to live again! I want to live again. Please, God, let me live again. (laughs) Hey, George! George! You all right? Hey, what's the matter? Now, get out of here, Bert, or I'll hit you again. Get out of here. What the Sam Hill are you yelling for, George? You... George... Bert, do you know me? Know you? <laughs> you kidding? I've been looking all over town trying to find you. I saw your car piled into that tree down there, and I thought maybe you... Hey, your mouth's bleeding. Are you sure you're all right? What you... <laughs> My mouth's bleeding, Bert! My mouth's bleeding! Do those pedals. Do the... There they are! Bert! What do you know about that? Merry Christmas! Well, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas, George! Merry Christmas!
Christmas will be hollow! Merry Christmas, Emporium! Merry Christmas, you wonderful old building alone! In jail. Go on home. They're waiting for you. <laughs> Mary! 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 Well, hello, Mr. Bank Examiner. How are you? Mr. Bailey, there's a deficit. I know, $8,000. George, I've got a little paper. I'll bet it's a warrant for my arrest. Isn't it wonderful? I'm going to jail. Merry Christmas. Reporters are... Where's Mary? Mary! Oh, look at this wonderful old drafty house. Mary! 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 Have you, have you seen my wife? Mary! 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 Daddy. 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 Kids! Pete! Oh, oh. <laughs> Kids, Janie! Janie, Tommy! You know, what made George trust him circumstances like that? What happened? He's going to jail for a mistake he didn't make, and he's happy about it. You know, in this scene, George is presented as this ideal character, taking whatever life gives him and being happy with it. What made him trust his circumstances like that? What made him trust God like that? We must die to our old life so Jesus can live through our new one. In Daniel chapter 3, we see three young men Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they're presented as these ideal, righteous men, seemingly without fault and, with, and they're without doubt even. But what made them trust their circumstances like that? What made them trust God like that? What happened? Why were they so devoted to God? We must die to our old life so Jesus can live through our new one. We find these three young Jewish men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, only in the book of Daniel. They were friends, companions of, of Daniel. Now, if all you knew about It's a Wonderful Light was the scene that we just saw, if that's all you knew about that movie, then you would say, wow, George Bailey gets it. He gets what's important. His wife, his kids, his family, friends, uh, helping others get a roof over their head and a relationship with God. You would say that about him if that's all you knew. Here in Daniel 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they get it too. They get what is most important in life. Love and devotion to God that is not based on God answering your prayers the way you want them to be answered. What made them trust God like that? With their very lives. Because if I was in that situation, if, if you were in that situation, I mean, what would you do? I would probably think, fiery furnace, about 2,200 degrees, big dumb golden statue, means nothing to me. Hey, I think I'm going to do this, right? Yeah, God won't care because God would never want to throw me into a burning fiery furnace, right? This is okay, right? Bowing down to a golden statue, it doesn't mean anything to me. Sometimes we have to make tough decisions. Are we devoted to God or just want Him to answer our prayers the way we want? Do we love God for who He is or just for what He might be able to give us? Do you ever pray for your baby all during pregnancy and then on delivery day you find out that he's no longer alive? And then you get to watch your wife deliver your lifeless child. God chooses not to intervene sometimes for his reasons, for his purpose. You ever pray for your dad who's all mangled up in a car wreck? And you have hope after about an hour that he'll pull through. But then his blood pressure starts dropping, things go south, and he dies. God chooses not to intervene sometimes for his reasons, for his purposes. The passage we have today, I'm passionate about this passage because after Tamara and I lost our son, our baby son, we were in a small group at another church. 
And this lady, she was adamant about, you know, you have to believe in matters of prayer and in matters of faith. You must believe and God will do it for you. You have to have faith. Well, didn't Jesus have enough faith? Who here would dare say that Jesus didn't have enough faith? And God the Father still didn't keep the cup of crucifixion from passing from his lips for his reasons, for his purposes. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. It's from Matthew chapter 26. Jesus loved the Father for who he is, not for what he could give him. We must die to our old life so Jesus can live through our new one. What we have here in our passage from Daniel 3 is that King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue. It was uh, about 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. And everyone in his kingdom is to worship and bow down uh, this image whenever any kind of music was played. Did you ever notice that? You go have a litany of things they're going to hear. And then they followed up with it, any kind of music. So anytime you hear a note, you were to bow down and worship this golden image, it seems like. So we must die to our old life so Jesus can live through our new one. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, he, this is a, his empire in the uh, 6th century B.C. He captured Jerusalem, causing it to fall in 587 B.C. And he took people from the southern kingdom of Judah. And he took them captive, taking them from Jerusalem all the way to his distant homeland. Well, as we read in Scripture... Back in Babylonia, a few Chaldeans told King Nebuchadnezzar that certain Jews, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are not worshiping his golden image. And King Nebuchadnezzar is not too happy with this. So in Daniel 3, verses 10, 11, and 13, we read, You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down in worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. It's from Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar questions the three men, asking them, almost seemingly like he's given them another chance. You know, is this true? Is this true that you're not doing this? Because these guys were very bright. They were the smartest in all the kingdom, Daniel and these three. They were the smartest. So maybe Nebuchadnezzar did not want to throw them into the fiery furnace because they're managing the affairs of the, of the province of Babylon. And so they're probably, he's probably reluctant to do that just because they're not worshiping this golden image. And he says, now if you're ready now, you, know, you can fall down and worship now. If you're ready... When you hear the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music. So, these guys are so good. I just wonder if Nebuchadnezzar was, was a little reluctant to this. And it's interesting that the king ends in this statement at that time. Daniel 3.15, verse C. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Well, this comment sets the king up for a big shock. When he hears the answer of the three men, we must die to our old life so Jesus can live through our new one. So in Daniel 3.16, we read, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand. O king, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Daniel 3, 16 through 18. I mean, wow, these three, I mean, these three believed God was able to deliver them out of the fiery furnace, able to deliver them out of the King Nebuchadnezzar's hands, just like Tamar and I believed that God would protect our baby Kenneth. 
So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they acknowledge even that if God does not deliver them, they are not gonna, they're not going to be disloyal to God, even if he doesn't deliver them out of this. We must die to our old life so Jesus can live through our new one. So what happened to these three that they became so devoted to God? What made them trust God with their very lives? You know, what do we know about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Well, we know at least four things from the book of Daniel. We know that they were exiled to Babylon. Uh, They probably didn't fly first class from Jerusalem to Babylon, and they probably lost family. I mean, can you imagine? In uh, the fall of Jerusalem is in 587 B.C. We all know or have an idea what warfare is like, and then if you're deported or if you are exiled to another country to serve that kingdom and that king, that's probably not a favorable condition. So, at least in that aspect of their lives, they weren't pampered. So that's, we get that from Daniel 1.3, where the chief eunuch was to bring some of the people of Israel, both the royal family and of nobility. And it was 1,678 miles from Jerusalem to Babylon. So that can give you an idea of how, you know, They had to travel that distance. That's not Fort Mill to Rock Hill. (laughs) They were gifted with talents in Daniel 1.4. So King Nebuchadnezzar wanted youths without blemish, of good appearance, skillful in all the wisdom, and down with knowledge and understanding because King Nebuchadnezzar wanted them to be in his court, in his palace, and he wanted to teach them, and he wanted the best of the best from the country that he conquered. (laughs) Next, in Daniel 1, 17a and 20, you know, it says God worked in their lives. So I, I'm seeing that there was a relationship between God and these three young men. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in his, all his kingdom. Wow. So there's some sort of relationship there. God is working in their lives dramatically. And then lastly, they prayed to God. They prayed to God in Daniel chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Here their lives are being threatened. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So they were exiled to Babylon, they were gifted with talents, God worked in their lives, and they prayed to God. That's what we know about these three youths. So at some point, perhaps, maybe, on their way from Babylon to Jerusalem, these three young Jewish men died to their old lives and made room for God to work in their new life, in their new lives. The answer they gave to Nebuchadnezzar was one of devotion and trust to God. And the king didn't like this. He didn't like this at all, because again, he became filled with fury. And the expression on his face, and can you imagine? Can you imagine him standing there and going, who is the God who is able to deliver you out of my hands? (laughs) Well, king, sorry to disappoint you, but our God, is able to deliver us out of your hands. Our God is able to deliver us out of your fiery furnace. We've been loyal to you, God, but we're not going to be that loyal to you. We serve our God, and we will not serve any other God. But that's not where it ends, is it? But if he doesn't, if he doesn't do that, we still won't serve your gods. I'm amazed at this devotion, at this trust that they had in God. We must die to our old lives to make room for Jesus to work in our new. So, of course, King Nebuchadnezzar was true to his word. He threw them into the fiery furnace. But then suddenly the king is astonished. 
Because he knew that he only threw three men in there. If we look at Daniel 3.25, he, Nebuchadnezzar, answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. So all the people there, they saw that the fire had no power over Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God, God didn't protect them from the fiery furnace, but he was with them in the fiery furnace. He was with them when they went through the fiery furnace. So God may not keep you out of the fiery furnace, but he will be there with you while you are in it. And look what the king said in Daniel 3.28. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own. I couldn't have said it any better, King Nebuchadnezzar. It looks like Nebuchadnezzar gets it too right there. We must die to our old life so Jesus can live through our new one. So what does it look like to die to your old life, to make room for Christ to live through your new one? Do you remember George Bailey? Well, this was his old life. Some of the things that he said to Mary Hatch. I know what I'm going to do tomorrow and the next day and the next year and the year after that. I'm shaking the dust off this crummy little town off my feet and I'm going to see the world. Italy, Greece, the Parthenon, the Colosseum. Then I'm coming back here to go to college and see what they know. And I'm going to build things, you see. I'm going to build airfields. I'm going to build skyscrapers 100 floors, 100 stories high. I'm going to build bridges a mile long. And then, of course, when he started falling for Mary Hatch... He says to her, now you listen to me. I don't want any plastics. I don't want any ground floors. I don't want to get married ever to anyone. You understand that? I want to do what I want to do. No, Jerry Bailey, J George Bailey tried to shake the dust off of the crummy little Bedford Falls. He tried. He tried. But then his brother Harry Bailey went to college. Harry Bailey comes back by himself. No, he had a wife. And you could see in George's heart, oh, man, I'm ready to go. So then George stays there again. He tried to shake the dust off of this crummy little town, Bedford Falls. Then World War II breaks out. Harry Bailey goes off and becomes a war hero. But remember, George Bailey saved Harry Bailey's life. So then, George, things get worse and worse. The deficit of $8,000. And then George prayed to God, asking for help when he was at Martini's Bar. Do you remember that? It went like this. God. Oh, God. Dear Father in heaven, I'm not a praying man, but if you're up there and you can hear me, show me the way. I'm at the end of my rope. Show me the way, God. But this was not George Bailey dying to his old life. This was the beginning of God working dramatically in his life by sending Clarence Oddbody AS2, angel second class. And George fought with Clarence the whole time, just like we fight with God sometimes, the whole time as he works in our lives. So what does dying to your old life look like? Well, check this out. Clarence! Clarence! Help me, Clarence! Get me back! Get me back! I don't care what happens to me! Get me back to my wife and kids! Help me, Clarence, please! Please! I want to live again! I want to live again! I want to live again. Please, God. We must die to our old life so Jesus can live through our new one. That's an idea of what dying to your old life looks like. 
So God does not always keep you out of the fiery furnace for his reasons, for his purpose. But he is there with you in the furnace. We must die to our old life so Jesus can live through our new one. Where might you be holding on to your old life? You know, I talked to a pastor um, a couple of weeks ago, and he was telling me about an author named David McGill. And he says, so I want to give him credit, and he says, you know, we don't call those things with beautiful wings, we don't call them caterpillars with wings, do we? We call them butterflies, not caterpillars with wings. So the caterpillar is died to his old life in a way and allowed God to work, make room for God to work in his new life. It's like, I know for me, sometimes I try to hold on to my old life and it's like putting beautiful wings on a caterpillar. It doesn't make room for God to work. So we must die to our old life so Jesus can live through their new one. As George Bailey did, he died to his old life to make room for Jesus to live his life through him. Somewhere, that's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. This devotion to God of loving God for who he is, not for what he can do for me or not what he can give me, but loving God for who he is. Somewhere, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego died to their old life, just like George Bailey. Would you guys join me in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to come together to worship you, to proclaim you, to worship your Son, Jesus Christ. We just thank you for all the little things that we sometimes take for granted. And Jesus, I ask that you take your message, your word, and work in the hearts of everyone here who heard this message and guide them along the way. Because I know dying to your old life is so hard. But boy, is it good to make room for you to live your life through us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this church. And thank you for all that you do for us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone together says, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. You and Tamara are some of the strongest people that I know. And we are blessed beyond measure to have you part of the Imagine Church family. As we stand this morning, remember, we sing this last song, that it's got to be our joy to say God's will and his way. We have to have faith even when we want to go off to the right or the left, that God's way is the way. We want to be happy and grateful and thankful for all that God gives to us. With this heart open wide from the depths, from the heights, I will bring. With these hands lifted high, hear my song, hear my cry, I will bring a sacrifice, I will bring. Take this light and let it shine. I want you to sing it again and believe it. Take this light and let it shine. Amen. I lay me down. I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Part.
really loud. <laughs> One of the things that my mom told me growing up is always give your smile away to somebody, to everybody, every day, every day, because it might be the only smile that they ever get. So as you go out there this week, put on a big smile, smile to people, show them that God loves them through all that you do and all that you say. Hope all of you have a wonderful, blessed week this week. We'll see you back here next week. Say this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you. And we go now to serve you. We go now to serve you. Amen. Amen. Greg, will you join me, please?